Hello, everybody, and welcome to the February RDBA webinar. Um, can I have you go ahead and put up the slides? We'll just jump right in. So you have joined us for today's Can Beans Can Do webinar, uh, Plant Forward Eating for Diabetes. So today's ultimate goal is to really talk about plant forward eating and the focus being on uh, people with diabetes because they're wondering how to make the manageable, delicious and sustainable meals as well. So our goal for you today uh, when you leave is that you're empowered to make better, uh, help your shoppers make better choices as they're struggling with all types of diabetes. But to be completely honest, as I was re reviewing the slides and looking at Mary Ellen's recipes, these are just wonderful plant forward eating uh, applications all the way around. So the other thing I would say is I love the idea of using beans just because we're at a time of inflation as food prices are high, the economy is uncertain. Shoppers are always looking for those budget friendly and healthy options. So next slide, please. We are so fortunate that canned beans came to us and they brought Mary Ellen Phipps, who is a dietitian, um, and she's joining us today from Houston. So welcome, Mary Ellen. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. Next slide, please. So if you do not know Mary Ellen, she is a registered dietitian, a media dietitian, a blogger, a cookbook author, and a type 1 diabetes warrior since the age of five. So she couples her skills, talents, and all of the education she's acquired with the traditional media, social media, and her blog to ultimately help people with all types of diabetes bring joy back to their kitchens. It's such a noble purpose and it's a pleasure to have her here. So if those real life qualifications aren't enough, she's definitely got the school and education to back it up. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition Sciences from Baylor University, and she has a Master's in Public Health uh, in epidemiology from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. And she's also working on her PhD in epidemiology from there as well. So without further ado, Mary Ellen, I would love for you to go ahead and take it away. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, that was a lovely introduction. Uh, one of my passions in the whole nutrition space, why I even wanted to do this as my career, is that I grew up in the diabetes world and with kind of some boring nutrition information always given to me. And I fortunately had um, a grandmother who was like, no, we're not going to settle for that. Uh, and so was very adamant that I was going to get to enjoy just as delicious food as she was. And so that's my passion now in my career is to help people with diabetes or any maybe condition that touches that um, bring some joy back to their kitchen. Let's get creative and really to give them the confidence. Uh, and that's where you come in uh, as you are meeting with shoppers or customers or whoever it is you're encountering uh, and helping give them ideas uh, in the kitchen. And so we're going to highlight some of those today, cover a little bit of science and then make some really fun recipes. Um, so next slide. So these are just some of my disclosures. Uh, if you want to know more about my work and the companies that I work with, you can head to milkandhoneynutrition.com for additional information on those. Next slide. Um, these are uh, the learning objectives that we're going to cover uh, today. I'll let you read through those. We're going to cite some evidence-based research studies that, you know, show us why um, the health benefits of canned beans for people with diabetes. Um, we're going to identify at least three ways clients with diabetes can increase consumption of those plant-based foods, and then three simple strategies to incorporate canned beans into meal snacks and other eating occasions. And some of those, I think, will surprise you. Next slide. So why can plant forward eating be beneficial? Well, I think if you're a registered dietitian, you likely know that plant foods provide quality protein, healthy fats, and fiber. Uh, we know that plant forward eating patterns have been shown to be beneficial for a number of different health markers. A lot of these are within the diabetes space, and some of them are things that aren't as relevant to diabetes. But across the board, um, eating more plants has been seen as beneficial. And one note I'll make, I meant to do this before this slide, is if you at any point in the presentation want to adjust the size of me or the size of the slides, there's a gray bar across the top. Um, you can put your cursor on the little three lines that are in the middle and adjust the size of that. And that'll be relevant when we get to the food demo part as well. Uh, next slide. 
So today, one of the things we're really going to focus on is that fiber component um, and really how canned beans can do that and how a plant forward eating pattern can really help increase fiber consumption because a diet with more plant foods tends to be higher in fiber, which can potentially lead to those health benefits and improvement and health markers that we were mentioning. So next slide. So diabetes prevention and a plant forward diet. Um, so consumption of healthy plant foods, including fruits and vegetables, nuts, coffee, and pulses is associated with a lower risk of developing type two, B, type two diabetes, excuse me, and generally healthy people. We know this from observational studies that strongly support the role of plant forward diets and components of plant forward diets in reducing the risk of type two diabetes. But you'll notice here that I'm saying plant forward. I'm not saying vegan. I'm not saying exclusively uh, vegetarian because that we know that we can reap some of these benefits. I'm gonna show you some examples here in a second while still incorporating some animal foods. Next slide. So this is a study that kind of highlighted this um, stepwise uh, reduction in type two, um, the prevalence of type two diabetes in a population based on these different diet categories. And so you can see the prevalence of um, decreased in a stepwise fashion with each reduction in animal products in the diet with non-vegetarians uh, have having a prevalence of type 2 diabetes at 7.6%. And you kind of go all the way down that staircase to vegans having uh, a prevalence of 2.9%. Next slide. But we know a plant for diet focuses on whole grains, pulses, fruit and vegetables, and limits meat and dairy, all the things I just said previously. But what we then have to take from this research and part of our job as registered dietitians of meeting people where they're at rather than just prescribing information is conveying to them that even small increases in plant foods without eliminating animal foods altogether can have health and diabetes management benefits. I think we can all agree on that. Next slide. So given this data, how do we encourage consumers and shoppers and the people you're coming into contact every day at your job with um, to eat more plants? That's one of the things we are really going to focus on today. Next slide. With my favorite uh, uh, food you're going to find on the grocery store aisles, canned beans. And I like to call them a diabetes superfood. I know we as dietitians don't tend to like the word superfood. This is me just prescribing. Uh, giving that uh, descriptor to canned beans because they are just so incredibly versatile, especially because of their fiber and their protein content um, in their ability to help promote um, stable blood sugars when we include them in the diet. So first, let's take a look at some research. What do we know about beans? Okay, next slide. So we know that adequate bean consumption can lower both total and LDL cholesterol levels. Next slide. We also know that eating beans can help prevent heart disease. Next slide. And we know that eating beans can help manage blood sugar levels. So when you combine this all together, notice those three things in the last three sides are all kind of in that um, metabolic field um, that people with diabetes or people with heart disease or people with metabolic synd syndrome are all dealing with. And so if we have this one food um, and that as Stephanie said is relatively inexpensive inexpensive, it's shelf stable, it has so many versatile applications, we are really at a unique point as dietitians to help consumers learn how to use um, canned beans in maybe non-traditional ways, in fun ways, in flavorful ways, um, in some really amazing applications. Next slide. So um, what this graph is looking at is basically telling us that most dietitians know what canned beans can do. Uh, we're gonna show you a little bit. Like basically, um, most of us as dietitians, we agree canned beans are a great thing to add to the diet, but consumers need some help. So if you'll look at the graph, um, you can see the green is what, um, when dietitians were polled, you know, do you believe canned beans can help with fill in the blank? And then when consumers were asked, uh, that's in the orangish red color there, that's where they responded. So you'll see there's a, a, a bigger portion for all of these that dietitians believe canned beans can help, um, but consumers don't necessarily have that knowledge. I've highlighted the controlled blood glucose levels just because it's relevant to diabetes. You can kind of see, we see the same trend um, across the board here. 
Next slide. So the American Diabetes Association says, um, this is straight from their website, beans are rich in vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fiber that are good for overall health and may also help prevent disease. Next slide. They are, you know, a plant-based protein source as well as a fiber source. We know that half cup of beans provides five to six grams of fiber and as much protein as one ounce of meat. Next slide. And this is your typical um, nutrition label you're gonna see on the side of a can of beans. Um, you'll see there, like we talked about, a significant source of protein, uh, significant source of fiber, uh, and so many versatile cooking applications that we're gonna talk about. Next slide. And when we're talking to consumers, I know a lot of times, um, at least on social media and on my blog, I'll get, I get questions with descriptors. Um, and so consumers really like, I think it helps us all think as human beings to kind of have buckets and categories and labels for things. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. So these are just kind of some of the labels, descriptors uh, that we can give to canned beans being low glycemic, heart healthy, protein packed, nutrient dense. They're an excellent source of fiber uh, for people who need to eat dairy free, gluten free. Um, they're obviously a great resource, gut health friendly, budget friendly, which is super relevant and important that we're including in our communications right now. Um, they're a vegetarian option. Uh, and I think most importantly for the average busy consumer, they're convenient. Um, it does not you know, require hours in the kitchen. It does not requ require a lot of prep time ahead of time. It, it offers an easy um, meal and option that can be ready relatively quickly. Next slide. And this is from a poll of a dietitian. So what do dietitians have to say about canned beans? Um, so 82% of dietitians that were polled agreed that the convenience of canned beans makes them an acceptable alternative to dried beans. Um, that's that convenience factor, the time saving factor. 73% um, of dietitians said eating beans can make a person healthier. And then 62% of dietitians agreed that the positive benefits of canned beans outweigh any potential negatives. And that leads us to, next slide, that beans are the number one recommended source of protein for clients who are looking for more plant-based protein sources. And I think this is because, not only because of their nutritional profile, but when we really get at the practicality of a recommendation we're gonna make, the actual culinary application that we can do with beans and the wide array of you know, food categories, meal categories, um, times of day that they can be applied. Next slide. So let's say, you're ready or you already knew that you want to recommend um, canned beans to the consumers that you encounter um, you know, every day. These are kind of some of the most common questions we're gonna get or pushback uh, that people might have about, well, what about this and what about that? So we kind of go through some of these um, uh, that maybe can help you answer those questions for the people that you encounter. Next slide. The biggest one I think with any canned product is you know, what about the sodium? So we know that sodium is primarily added for taste, not for food preservation, but a simple, put it in a strainer, rinsing canned beans removes 41% of the sodium. And that's a pretty significant amount. Um, and so, and it's a very not time consuming way to make that reduction for the consumer. Next slide. But beans have carbs. This is a big, big one I get in the diabetes community. Um, you know, unfortunately, as you're probably well aware, there is this huge stigma that carbs bad for people with diabetes. And I fight this battle every day, as I'm sure you do, um, to convey to people that carbs are not the enemy. Um, we wanna look for complex carbohydrates. We wanna look for quality carbohydrates. And this is where canned beans um, come in as an example of that, because we know that a diet with a low glycemic index um, or a low glycemic load um, and 25 grams or more of fiber a day can help normalize blood glucose, blood insulin, and body weight. And so because um, beans are a low glycemic food, they offer a quality source of fiber, they can fit within this and offer a great way to kind of reach these goals um, for the nutrients we're wanting people with diabetes and beyond uh, to, to hit with their diet. Next, next slide, sorry. And as I said, given their low glycemic index, they are the perfect food to help improve uh, blood sugar management. And I think also, and we're gonna get into this with some of the recipe examples, 
but they're, they're one of those perfect foods to also get people, um, whether it's diabetes or another chronic illness, um, back to getting excited in the kitchen. And so that's where I think those of you listening today, really with what you do day to day, have a really unique experience because most likely you're the dietitian that they are coming to after, or they're encountering after they have, you have seen the, they have seen the doctor after they've been told eat this way or the other. And they're now having to make the choice of, you know, okay, what do I buy at the grocery store? What do I buy when I go to the store? Um, and we really have the opportunity to get people excited about being in the kitchen and also getting, getting them to a point where they understand the application of what they've been told at the doctor's office or what they've been told from the clinical dietitian. Um, and so I think it's a really exciting um, point in the process to be at to really kind of help give them back that confidence with a food that's as convenient as canned beans. Next slide. And so this one, uh, I also get asked a lot about that I'm worried beans will give me gas. I was actually live on air doing a TV segment one time and had the host bring this up uh, and it was quite comical. Uh, but just like anyone who is increasing fiber in their diet or anyone who's making a change to your diet is that if you are eating beans regularly, your body adapts and you do not experience noticeable gas or flatulence than you would if you're just eating them randomly. And so this is where I encourage people to just start including them regularly and your body will adapt, your digestive system um, will adapt and not produce near as much um, gas or flatulence than they may have thought that, that it would otherwise. Next slide. Well, what about if they say, you know, I thought canned foods were bad for me. And this is where we really have the opportunity to kind of remove maybe the health halo from other foods or something and just kind of get everything on an equal lane playing field and really convey to people that canned foods offer not only an economical, but also a convenient way to enjoy some incredibly nutrient rich foods like vegetables, legumes, and beans. Uh, I know for me, as a working mom, um, I rely very heavily on canned foods and canned beans because they're convenient. It doesn't require me to do a whole lot of prep in the kitchen. And, you know, for those nights that we all have where, you know, we didn't maybe necessarily think about what we're going to serve for dinner or lunch or whatever it is, it offers an easy, quick solution um, in the moment. They're incredibly shelf stable. We don't have to worry uh, um, about near as much food waste. You get the You get the idea. I could go on and on. Next slide. So how to include canned beans. So these are just some easy ideas off the top of, my, uh, not off the top of my head, but uh, that we wanted to include, you know, you've got salad, you can add some, whether they're cooked or, um, you know, straight from the can and rinsed um, on top of a salad. They're great for soups. I know I'm a Texan and it's like practically, uh, heresy to say like that you can't put beans in chili. I grew up with beans in chili and will always put beans in my chili, um, but other delicious soups um, from around the world have incorporated um, beans and canned beans offer a more, uh, maybe a convenient way uh, to do that. Baked potatoes, they're amazing on top. Um, dips and spreads, uh, purees. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna show you one example of that today. Pizza, one thing I like to do for my kids too is just like a real a kind of easy, more nutrient dense is if we're making pizza at home and I have a crust maybe I've bought at the store, I'll spread um, a layer of, you know, maybe mashed um, canned beans and then put the sauce and then put cheese and whatever else they're gonna put on top. It's a, a, kind of an easy way to get some extra nutrition in there. They can be a meat replacement as we're all well aware. They go great on top of toast. Um, chili we talked about, um, they go great with veggie dishes kind of to make them a little bit heartier, make them a little bit more filling, and then desserts, which I think we're all probably possibly aware of at this point, um, you know, the, um, you know, black bean brownies or chickpea cookie dough, things like that have been very, very trendy over the last several years, um, but there's even more application beyond that. Um, and this is the one for consumers that I think if they're a little bit curious in the kitchen can get them really, really excited. Um, and I'm gonna show you the last recipe we're gonna do today is gonna cover that. So with that, we're gonna move into the kind of demo portion of our program here. I'm going to turn on my stove, get my pan ready. We'll go to the next slide. And so these are all recipe, these recipes are all from, I have two cookbooks. Um, we'll share the information at the end. Um, all of these recipes, the first two are from my first cookbook and the third one is from 
the second cookbook. Uh, but I'm gonna heat up a pan here for this first one. We're gonna make garlic creamed spinach. And this is one of my favorite dishes from the book because it is an incredibly simple recipe. However, it is so versatile and you can change it up so much to fit your own needs uh, or the consumer's needs, um, depending on what they're wanting to do with it. Uh, so to get started, I'm going to add, turn my heat down there a little bit. I'm going to add uh, some oil to my pan. Uh, you, recipe calls for olive oil. You can use whatever cooking oil uh, you're used to. And then we're gonna add in some garlic and some chopped up onion. I like a lot of garlic and onion. Uh, I used a little bit more than the recipe calls for, but you can adjust this up or down however much you want. I think we can all agree cooking is an art, not a science so much like baking is. But I'm gonna get these in here and then give them a good stir. And if, you've if you can see the recipe there on your screen, um, or you can adjust that little thing I was talking about earlier to make my screen bigger if you wanna see what I'm doing, totally up to you. But we're gonna let these cook a little bit and get those flavors going. And then I've got over here, again, this is a super simple recipe. I'm gonna let that do its thing. I've got, this is just a bag of frozen spinach that I, before we started today, I drained off, got as much of the water out of it as I could. We're gonna add that in a little bit. And then I have a can of cannellini beans or just um, very uh, neutral white beans. And what we're gonna do, um, we're actually talking before we went live today about the use of aquafaba and how there are so many different culinary applications for it. And so this is one of them. I've got my can of beans and I'm gonna come back here to my blender, but I'm just gonna take my jar that goes to my blender. I'm gonna add the entire can of beans in here, liquid and all. Set that aside, put my lid on, and then we're just gonna blend this up. And so you can see here, we just got a normal can of beans. It's gonna get a little bit loud here, so if you wanna turn your volume down or mute me for about 10 seconds, I'm gonna turn this on. And now basically what we've done is we've got a quasi kind of cream sauce, if you will. So those beans have blended up so incredibly smooth and so instead of using cream for a cream spinach, we've now got not only protein rich, but an incredibly fiber rich sauce that we're gonna add to this dish. So we'll add our spinach before we do that. Garlic and onion smells so good. I purposely am having a late lunch today because after we are done with this, I know what I'm having for lunch. Um, so those are good. I, normally I might let these go for a little bit longer, uh, but all we're gonna do is we're gonna take our spinach, add it in there, I'm gonna break it up. The other thing I love about this recipe is if you think about like a um, spinach artichoke dip or some sort of like cheesy type dip, you can add cheese to this if you want to, because we're still getting all those nutrients that come with the beans. Uh, and it, we've still got that added fiber, uh, the protein, but if you wanted to add cheese to it and make it a dip, I've used it uh, as is, as a dip. I've used it on top of toast, like we've talked about. I've used it just as it, as it exists, as a side dish. Um, there's so many different applications you can do to this. The other thing I'm gonna do right at the end is I'm gonna add some salt and pepper in. But what you can also do is add any sort of seasoning mixture that you prefer. Um, you know, if that's, you know, a blend you have, a different combination, some people, really enjoy certain combinations of seasonings in all of their foods, so you can do that. And here's the moment of truth where we just kind of pour our sauce on and it comes out so smooth and that literally took like eight seconds in the blender. This. And then all we're gonna do is stir this up. And like I said, I might've let those onions go a little bit longer, but really this is truly like, five minutes, 10 minutes tops dish. Um, again, going back to that convenience factor. And we just stir it up. And then 
it keeps well in the fridge um, and it's delicious. I'll put some salt and pepper on here. And then you're good to go. You could also add garlic powder, onion powder, um, any sort of seasonings you want to kind of take it, um, kind of kick it up another notch, if you will. I don't know if you guys can see that from here, but it smells incredible. And like I said, it, um, the recipe makes, it makes a good amount and you can use it for so many different things. So that is kind of our appetizer side dish space if you will. It's an incredible recipe. I encourage you to try it. And now we're going to move on to more of a snack application, if you will. So we can go to the next slide there while I kind of get things situated here. I'm going to clear off my space. And this recipe I love because, again, there's so many different ways that you can take it. Um, you can do it the way it's written, or you can um, move this off so you can see everything. Um, or there are some kind of shortcuts you can take with products that you can find at the grocery store. And so this is a roasted chickpea. Um, and if you'll think about those, like the snacks you find in the grocery store, like the crunchy snacks, um, there's lots of different brands out there. This is essentially making those at home or uh, for a snack or having them as a side dish. But really all we're gonna do is we're essentially making like a honey mustard dressing and then coating the chickpeas, laying them out and baking them. So we're gonna start with some yellow mustard. You could also use Dijon mustard if you wanted to. I love this recipe, but what I was getting at before about like if you wanted to take um, more of like a shortcut, if you don't wanna make your own, you could use any sort of salad dressing you like and toss um, your ingredients in that. I've got some oil here. I've got some garlic powder and some honey, you could also use, uh, we put in the book, you could use agave if you wanted to, but you could also, you could use any sort of syrup. Um, if you like the maple flavor, you could do that as well. And then a little bit of water. And all I'm gonna do is give this a good stir, get a good consistency. If you like to mix up dressings in a jar, you can do that too. And then pour them over our chickpeas. You see that here, we've got a very nice looking dressing there. And then what we're gonna do is I've got, a can, this is a can of chickpeas that I drained and then rinsed, like we talked about. Remember, we're getting rid of almost half, 41% of that sodium when we do that, um, right before we started today. So I'm just gonna dump these in here and then we give them a good toss. And the other thing I forgot to mention at the beginning, I'll see if I can pull one of these out for you guys. Uh, with chickpeas, these, the little skins, so if you want this to be more of like that crunchy, crunchy snack, you can spread your chickpeas out between two kitchen towels and the instructions are right um, in the book as well and kind of give them, rub those towels back and forth gently and it'll get those skins off. That's how you get them super crunchy. Or if you want more of just like a roasted be, uh, chickpea type uh, consistency, consistency that maybe you'd serve you know, as a side dish or something like that, you don't have to bother. I don't usually bother doing that, maybe because I'm being lazy, maybe because I'm in the interest of time and they still turn out absolutely de delicious with some crunch to them. But you'll see we've coated our, our chickpeas here. And now all I'm gonna do is spread these out in the paint on this a parchment lined pan, makes for super easy cleanup. And kind of spread them out as much as you can. I also usually will double up this recipe actually, where I do uh, two cans of chickpeas at a time. And you just spread them out as much as you can. Right here, make sure you guys can see that. And you can add salt and pepper to these too, if you like. Um, my, I don't know if anybody else's kids are like this, but my kids see me adding pepper to things and they automatically assume it's spicy. So I've gotten in the habit of not adding it to these, even though I think it's delicious. Um, but you can see here, so I've got them ready to go. And I actually have a tray that I cooked this morning that I wanna show you guys so you can see what they look like. 
So you can see here just how nice and toasted they look. They come out so delicious, so crunchy. Um, again, it's super easy. You can change up the flavors like we talked about. If you're not into the honey mustard flavor, you could use any sort of store-bought dressing or sauce that you want, just tossing those, the chickpeas in it, and then you pop them in the oven for like 25-ish minutes, depending on how many you have on there, and they're good to go. This obviously is a protein-rich and fiber-rich snack option uh, or side dish for a dinner or for lunch. Uh, and that kind of rounds out the, the savory component. So hopefully those give you, uh, you know, an idea of maybe just the out of the box, not your traditional, I'm just gonna serve beans on the side uh, kind of idea. Uh, and then now we're gonna move into that dessert concept that I talked about. So my second cookbook is all about diabetes friendly desserts. And one of the things that I got really excited about is sharing how we can put beans into our desserts. Because when I'm making desserts for people with diabetes, or when I'm writing a recipe for people with diabetes, my main focus is not necessarily how can I reduce the sugar in the recipe, but more how can I increase the fiber and how can I increase the protein? How can I make this a more nutrient dense and also in my opinion, a more satisfying eating experience and have it still taste good. So like we've talked about, beans are kind of one of the perfect tools for that. So we're gonna make some oatmeal cookie protein bites. I'm gonna clear this off and bring, I'm gonna use my food processor, but you could also use what, um, a high powered blender like I did over here for the creamed spinach. And just like you would an energy bite or um, some sort of protein ball, uh, we're just kind of gonna blend everything together. And so for this recipe, uh, we're actually gonna use not chickpeas, but your standard like white bean. This is uh, the same, I'm using the same type of canned bean that I used in the first recipe, but I'm gonna start by adding that to my food processor. And one of the things that you always get, this is always makes for an interesting conversation with consumers, is the idea that you can take any sort of flour base. Um, so here we're gonna use almond flour and oats and beans or canned beans, excuse me, and puree them together. And what kind of texture do you get? You get essentially cookie dough texture. And then it's up to us to add the flavorings that we like uh, or anything else to kind of give it that cookie dough flavor. Uh, I'm gonna add in some almond flour. And then I've got a cup of oats, but I've divided it into two parts. We're gonna puree half of them and then we're going to mix in the other half at the end for a texture thing though you could put them all in at the same time if you wanted to um, i've also got a little bit of maple syrup for sweetness and it really kind of helps neutralize any sort of flavor that may have come through with the beans even though these are a very very neutral neutral tasting bean um, it doesn't take a whole lot of sweetener to make this taste like cookies essentially. I've got some vanilla extract and some almond extract. Uh, pro tip, when you're using almond extract, make sure it's actually almonds. The other day I was making muffins and accidentally put peppermint in there and that was definitely not what we were expecting, uh, but we recovered. Okay, now I've got cashew butter. You can, you don't have to use cashew butter. I like kind of the cookie taste to it that it lends, but you could easily do peanut butter, almond butter, whatever you have on hand, sunflower seed butter. Um, any sort of nut or seed butter. It's kind of going to help these stick together. I'm getting the whiffs of the almond extract. It smells so good. And then lastly, cinnamon. I'm a big cinnamon fan. If you are not, you can add any sort of other seasoning. You could do like a pumpkin pie spice. Um, these are very, very customizable again. So at this point, we're going to put our food processor lid on. You can turn the volume down here and mute me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this run for a little bit. And that's really all it takes. It blends together very well thanks to the texture of those beans. We're gonna carefully pull our blade out and we're gonna add you could, I mean, technically you could do this in the, uh, 
in your food processor bowl. I like to transfer to a different bowl just for ease of mixing. And I'm gonna get my bigger spatula here. And then this is at the end where we're gonna mix in the rest of our oats. Uh, like I said, you could blend those in ahead of time uh, or you can, or excuse me, while we're blending them together or you can save them for the end like this. I like the, the end texture result when we put them in at the end like this. The other thing you can do with this, if you wanna add chocolate chips, if you wanna add some dried fruit, any sort of mix in goes really well in this. My kids naturally, like much of, many other kids are big fans of chocolate chips. And so we will add chocolate chips into this. I'm gonna add my oats in. And we're just gonna mix this together. You'll, if you make this recipe at home, you'll see, you can see here, we've very much got a cookie dough like consistency. It, um, it really, really, um, I always get very excited when people kind of realize the versatility of beans and that we can get beyond just the dinner plate, we can get into desserts, this um, even into breakfast and sweetening some things that are, excuse me, adding them to breakfast desserts. So once we get kind of our dough like this, I'm gonna show you, I like to use a cookie scoop. You can use your hands. Uh, this is kind of what they turn out to be. These very cute bite size uh, cookie bites. Our photographer for the cookbook made them look a lot better than I can with my cookie scoop, but they taste the exact same. Again, I really like to add in like some sort of mix in if you want to. It makes for uh, maybe a more fun themed dessert, but it's really kind of just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to putting uh, beans and, or canned beans into your dessert recipes. So next slide. We And so the other place that you absolutely should go for, not only um, great recipe ideas, but also um, a whole host of uh, professional resources is cannedbeans.org. This website for me and the content I create has been such a wealth of information uh, from the educational resources, both professionally and for you to use with uh, consumers, as well as um, the recipe ideas. They've got some delicious recipes. All of the photos that we used throughout this presentation either came from the recipes that we created here or recipes that are on cannedbeans.org. Uh, Next slide. So this is how um, you can get in touch with me. Clearly you've uh, seen by now, I love canned beans. I use canned beans and a ton of the recipes that you will find on milkandhoneynutrition.com. And I'm a big proponent for easy, conven convenient and affordable ways for people to manage their diabetes, for them to eat more plants. And canned beans does that hands down every time. That's my email address, you're welcome to email me. You can find me on Instagram, it's Milk in Honey Nutrition. Uh, and then on TikTok, I promise I don't do any crazy dances. I don't do anything that all these young kids are doing. Um, it's purely educational videos over on Diabetes Nutritionist. And then I think, next slide we have, um, these are the two books that these recipes came from. The first two recipes we did were from my first book, The Easy Diabetes Cookbook, and the last one was from The Easy Diabetes Desserts Cookbook. They kind of go hand in hand. I like to call them sister books, and you can find them pretty much anywhere books are sold. Amazon, Target, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble. Most uh, retailers carry them. And then I think we ended a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but we are open for, I'm happy to answer any questions about the recipes or about the content that we discuss. Excellent. I don't know about everybody else who's watching, but I am hungry now officially. I <laughs> definitely should have waited to eat lunch, but um, well done. Your recipes are amazing. So thank you for sharing them with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. I'm going to go eat lunch right after this.
<laughs> so uh, for those in the audience, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I have a couple questions myself, but before I dive into that, I recognize that I never even introduced myself. So uh, for anybody who is watching live, I'm Stephanie Schultz. I am with the Association of Retail and Consumer Professionals, but I am I'm also a dietitian and I'm the RD ambassador to the RDBA, which is why I am here and get the opportunity to um, not only introduce, but also go through the Q&A part with Mary Ellen as well. So. Uh, you mentioned early on in the um, presentation about aquafaba. Can you talk a little bit about what that is um, for anybody who maybe doesn't know the term and talk about if it is only from chickpeas or can that be with any beans? Um, so it's the liquid um, primarily thought of as just chickpeas, but it is in any like uh, neutral flavored uh, bean. So like I would consider the liquid that's in those, um, the great northern beans or the cannellini beans that I was using uh, to be aquafaba as well. And it is, it's definitely become one of those more, um, it's been used forever, but it's been getting a lot more um, attention in food media lately just because of its, its versatility as uh, an egg white replacement or an egg replacement for people who either have egg allergies or for whatever reason uh, want to try an egg alternative. It can whip up like you would do like um, an egg white meringue. You can do that with aquafaba. You can you do it like we did here. It can kind of help lend a um, a creaminess and a thickness to sauces, um, just much like egg whites would. A lot of people will bake with it as well as an egg replacement um, in like a cookie recipe or a cake recipe. The flavor is very, very neutral. So you don't, you don't, especially in like a baking recipe or something like that, you're not, you don't have to worry about your cake tasting like beans or anything like that. Um, it's going to take on the flavor of whatever you're cooking with it very, very well. And it really encourages using, you know, everything that we're buying um, rather than that liquid just kind of getting washed down the drain when you're rinsing your beans or whatever it may be. I love that. Uh, just out of curiosity, when you're adding that, then because you're not rinsing anything, you talked a little bit about consumers and their sodium questions. When you create your recipes, do you take that into account then, I assume? Or is that... Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of um, there or there's going to be some saltiness that comes with it. It's not super significant, um, but I, I, I compare it to kind of like whether you're using like salted butter or unsalted butter. It's going to adjust things slightly, but it's not going to make a huge impact on the flavor profile of the dish. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, one other question that I have been asked, where can people find more recipes when it comes to using beans obviously you shared your two cookbooks yes yes absolutely cannedbeans.org like i said is um has a wealth of um, great recipes and resources um, i have several on my website i know i have a ton of dietitian colleagues who are rightfully so big fans of canned beans as well and they have them on their websites i also a little trick i like to do is if you go to google and type in like maybe the ingredients you have. So let's say you have a can of black beans or something like that and some other stuff. You can type that into Google and it'll pull up recipes that have those ingredients. Um, a lot of people don't normally think to do that, but you know how like Google will pop up recipe cards. It'll pop up recipes with those with those options. That's a fun suggestion. That's like a <laughs> It sounds like a fun, we have a snow day in the Midwest right now, so it sounds like a fun snow day activity. Like, okay, here are yeah. some things that I put on the counter now. What can we do with it? Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, since it's uh, just you and me on the screen, I'm going to do it at Ask Mary Ellen Anything. Um, what's your favorite <laughs> and why? <laughs> what, sorry, I cut out. What, what is your favorite bean and why? Oh goodness. Um, I am especially partial to canned chickpeas just because they have so much versatility. Um, they And I like the kind of heartier, like firmness to them uh, where you can blend them up and make them super soft like you can in a cookie dough or they can hold their own in a soup or a stew or like if we're roasting them. Uh, and again, they're they're so flavor neutral that they really take on whatever flavor of what you're putting with it. Um, so I think if I had to pick one, but then again, I could also say cannellini beans or I could say kidney beans because I love them in chili. So I f it feels unfair to have to pick a, <laughs> pick a favorite. It's kind of like asking which child is your favorite, right? We don't have an answer to that today. <laughs> um, 
what are some ways that we could help our consumers to encourage their children to eat beans? I mean, you talked, you shared a lot of great recipes today, but anything, um, you know, I mean, obviously the sweeter stuff helps, but yeah. I would love additional thoughts. Well, so the sweeter stuff is actually a good way to get kids comfortable with beans. So I'll, I'll use my kids as an example. So I've been making these um, chickpea cookie dough bites. That's, it's a recipe on my website for years with my kids and they just, it's normal to them to go get the can of chickpeas and we, we drain it and rinse it and we put them in and we make them. So they're, they were, they're used to seeing that and it's in a food that they really, really love and really love eating. So then when I try to introduce uh, you know, a can of chickpeas and something else like maybe chili or like maybe these roasted chickpeas. It's not foreign to them and it's not something they're afraid of. They associate it with a food that they really love. So if it's that your kids maybe have not had exposure to them or are nervous about them, try a way that a food that you know they're going to very much um, enjoy. So for my kids, it was cookie dough bites met, was went along with canned chickpeas. So when they saw me using them other places, um, it was an easy thing. I also think I feel like this is the classic answer a lot of us dietitians give, but it's letting your kids help. Getting them in the kitchen really gives them a sense of ownership. And as they start, mine are like kind of mid to older elementary school age. So they're really getting into that, wanting to be a little bit more creative in the kitchen with me and kind of taking some ownership of like, oh, well, can we try this or can we do this? And just letting them kind of have some ownership in what they're making. That's fantastic. Um, and I really appreciate where you started with that, the idea of getting them comfortable that this is a food that we use in a lot of different ways. That's fabulous. Yeah. Um, and looking at the chat, there is a question. Uh, why do you use the uncooked oats, but not flour in the bites? So we don't want to use uh, raw wheat flour ever. You're not supposed to consume that raw from a food safety perspective. Um, and so that's why we use oats because we're not cooking these. If you wanted to use traditional flour, um, actually this answer is twofold. If you wanted to use traditional flour, you could maybe, um, you could add some aquafaba or you can add an egg and bake them. Um, okay. But we don't want to consume flour raw. Um, but then from a blood sugar management perspective, my favorite combination for, um, any sort of dessert is going to almost always be some combination of almond flour and oats. And that's because of one, the texture it gives, but also the glycemic profile is um, more blood sugar friendly than traditional all-purpose flour would be. Um, so even though we wouldn't use all-purpose flour in a no-bake recipe, um, the oats have more fiber and protein than traditional flour. And we know almond flour has significantly less carbohydrate, more fat, more protein, um, slightly more fiber as well. Um, and I love the texture it gives, and it it allows for a very pleasant eating experience, something that tastes good, but also for people with diabetes, a much slower um, glycemic response that hopefully will promote stable blood sugars throughout the day for them. Excellent. That is really good information to have. Anybody else have questions that they want to share or have me ask Mary Ellen while we have her on the line? Like I said, your content was absolutely awesome. Um, at this point, I'll just go ahead and start our thank yous and I'll keep an eye on the chat. But first of all, thank you to you, Mary Ellen. I mean, for sharing your skills, for all that you do for the diabetic population and just sharing your, your knowledge with all of us today. A huge shout out to the canned beans um, just for your support of not only retail dietitians, but continuing to keep um, all of this front of mind and teaching us all the great ways to use a shelf stable and inexpensive item. And then to all attendees, thank you for joining us. Without members of RDBA, RDBA does not exist. So appreciate all of you who joined live today um, and everybody who is registered. Um, I will be following up within probably by the end of the night tonight uh, or early tomorrow morning, you'll get your continuing professional education credit certificate. Um, as well as some links to our upcoming webinar. We have one coming up in March um, related to social media and things like that. We know everybody um, on the member side loves to learn more about marketing and things like that. Um, but I'll send a link to that as well as the certificate and then of course a link to canbeans.org. So again, thank you, Mary Ellen, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.